So um, we've done we've done uh, the early part. So we've 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 uh, created our site. We have um, requested our spectrum and got some. Awesome. Thank you for the questions. Um, now we're going to do the network integration piece. We mentioned we're going to do we're going to connect to some VLANs. So let's go into the um, the edge cluster, Kevin, and uh, get that done. So one of the unique uh, features that Slona has, um, one of the things that really um, got me interested um, early on was the um, concept of IP domains. And basically what this means is we can connect traditional enterprise IP domains into the cellular network, into the private cellular network. So we're doing, and the first one we're creating here is an internal, a natted internal IP domain. So this one is going to the edge and it's being natted there onto the enterprise land. So this one, not reachable from the enterprise land, completely natted. And we're saying, you know, this is just for staff devices. So that's our internal IP domain. We're also creating ones for the AMRs. Those did need to be reachable from the enterprise domain. So we're creating an external IP domain and we just put in the VLAN tag, which is 1050. And when we do that, as soon as we click add, the um, Slona Edge behind me, which is on a, a VLAN trunk, is creating a sub interface on that VLAN. So now, literally within a couple of seconds, that will have a sub interface on VLAN 1050 and we're connected to that VLAN. Francois? When you say internal, you're just talking about? Internal to Solona. Yeah, CBRs to CBRs communication. Mm -hmm. They won't communicate to each other. Similar, similar to Wi-Fi, okay. they're not going to, you're not going to get client to client. Okay. They are, each, each device is a little island. They're not, they're not going to talk to each other unless you use something like an external IP domain and then we're using the enterprise LAN to connect those. So, and our scanners, as we said, again, we're connecting those to the VLAN 1060 and we're doing that to inherit security policy. Uh, the security policy. So those are created. We've got our enterprise network integration. So next we'll go and uh, create our device groups. Our device groups are important because um, that's how we control how devices connect, what, what part of the network they're connecting to, uh, and also um, how traffic policy is applied to the various um, devices. So Kevin's going to create the different device groups. We're not going to assign any devices to them yet, but we'll just create those device groups quickly now. And then once those are done, we'll uh, we'll move on to the actual device enablement and allocation. You can see this is all happening pretty quickly, right? Like this is very simple. And as we said before, everyone has the skills to do this in-house already. No magic. Interested in like so this part where we have device groups and classifications of things. You know, um, we've heard a lot while we're here about sort of the convergence of, you know, the wireless world and that you know like the private cellular world. Um, are there backend hooks to tie this into like NAC solutions that I can dynamically classify things, or is that something that I mean it's probably early, but is it something that you guys see down the road and? So I can just treat this like another radio network and another set of devices and absolutely. Um, in, Intent-based networking and network automation is absolutely where we are. Application-driven networking is, you know, that's something we strongly believe in. You know, we believe that there will be a future where the application developer will be able to say from their app, please give me this from the network. We, and the network will change to deliver that quality of service for that app for that period of time that it needs it, and the app will rec will request it will will provide that as on an as needed basis, and the network will change to to meet that need. So yes, absolutely, we we will those those things are all being um, developed right now, and everything API driven from from word one means that we're building that foundation from the get go. Okay, just to clarify, so that's where we are, where you are mentally or actually developed and in practice? Uh, yeah, I mean, the network access control, so things like single sign-on, Yeah, um, we're on our way. Those, okay. those, those things are coming in future releases and we're some single sign-on before the end of this year. Those are, I think, we've got incoming releases. Yeah, I think maybe not next one, but the one after, I think. I'd have to, again, we'll clarify 
but um, I'd, I'd have to double check with Panit. Great. Um, but yes, they are definitely on the roadmap. It's something that we're being asked for. Perfect. Um, okay, so where are we? We're in devices. Okay, so let's go into our devices list and we can start getting some, getting some things connected. So, yeah. Do you have like how long this takes if you weren't being bothered? <laughs> um, if uh, I can get this network stood up, we did it in 20 minutes. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and a part of that is the FCC. Get, yeah, get that, that's, that's included. That's, that's from power on to connected devices with micro slices and traffic policies and everything that we're going to show you, 20 minutes. And do you have like a nice cookbook for us to follow? Yes. Thanks. Um, okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll assign some of the devices to the correct groups. So uh, we've got the zebra scanner there, which is, I think we've got a tablet there um, for that. So we'll put that in the scanner group. We've got a staff hotspot the Insego M2000 that I've got here in front of me. Um, we're going to assign that to the staff group. And then we've got um, a couple of other bits and pieces which we're going to assign. And the AMR, which is a multi-tech e-cell just back there, which we have the access camera attached to. And um, that's going to go in the AMR group. Yes. Is it possible to do a bulk assignment of devices by sending it as DSV or something? Yes. Yeah. So you'll see the, the check boxes yeah. down the side there. So you can click those and assign, okay. and the same for activation as well. So what we'll what we'll show you now. So um, Kevin, if you do a filter based on activated, uh, yeah, device status. I think if you've got a status and activated. Oh, sorry. That's, no, assigned. Provisioned uh, device groups. Or just no, oh, they're not assigned. Well, we can see the ones that are assigned. Just yeah. just click the ones that are assigned, and we can activate them all in one go. So, Jared, what, what would you recommend if you had an AMR that just has an Ethernet port, or any device that, like, we would put some sort of wireless bridge in, or an AP in that kind yeah. of mode? Yeah, are there, there's a, there's a there bunch of choices type devices yeah. for that. There's a bunch of choices. You can go for um, there's a Sierra Wireless. I've got some simple um, like RV55. Um, the multi-tech e cell is great. You know that's that's a really good one. The um, Cradle Point. I've got some lower end stuff now. Um, BC. I've got some rugged sort of Ethernet CBRS bridge devices, and even the um, We've got now the, the latest Netgear M5 Nighthawk, latest uh, 5G version. Do you maintain a compatibility list of clients if you have validated work with the Salona solution? So we've got, we've got one list where we keep a list of uh, CBRS um, FCC certified devices, which if you go to docs.salona.io and just search for devices, that list is there. And um, we are working on a device certification program which will have actual certified on Salona. This would be a Salona certification program, not like a, not like a Wi-Fi Alliance certification no. program. Okay. It'll be, we have tested this to these parameters on the Salona network. Awesome. Rubber stamp. Yeah. What would the outdoor range be? Is it in, could I use this, say, uh, as a Wi-Fi backhaul, meaning could I have yeah. solar on a golf course in the middle of Tahoe forest. Mm -hmm. So there's no cellular anywhere. Yeah. And I could put this outside and use, put access points with solar on them and use this as a backhaul. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, because we're currently the APs that we have are 4G. So you're sort of 150 by 26. So 150 down, 26 up. So you're not going to set the world alight in terms of bit rate, but absolutely. And there are, customers doing that right now and you can get um like obviously um companies like cradle point bc zyxel they all have um equipment that, that does that exactly that cbrs to wi-fi there are customers out there also who are using simple bridges to connect their 
Meraki APs or whatever else. And I think Meraki actually have a CBRS on Wi-Fi um, enabled device. And we were working with ITDRC just a couple of weeks ago, deploying those um, on the back of our system. So yes, absolutely, that use case. And ITDRC, what they're doing there is they're using our outdoor radio going into a compound in an emergency situation and deploying the Meraki um, Wi-Fi router with CBRS backhaul um, in the various tents and offices that people have in a compound. So that's a, basically exactly that use case. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we've got some activated devices and we should see, I'm gonna restart this, that will uh, connect in a second. Um, and next, now that we've got some devices connecting, we'll start defining the applications that we're going to, um, that we've already discussed. So we've got our, um, the two that we discussed early on, we have our scanner application and we have our AMR application. Um, now, application awareness is how there's the first step to sort of policy control. We've got our devices authenticated, we have our device groups. Next bit is to tell the system, these are our applications that we want to do some control over. Now we have a number of different ways that we can define an application. For simplicity here today, we're just saying, okay, for the scanners, we're gonna be running um, an application called G-Ping, just 200 millisecond pings, it shows you a nice graphical um, output. And we're just gonna ping to a host. So we're gonna say, okay, traffic going to this host, that's the application. But we can do um, ports that traffic is going to, we can uh, select ports that it's coming from, so source or destination. We can even do DSCP tags. And we're doing, uh, our machine learning team is hard at work developing some automated classification intelligence, which will learn your network and learn what's happening across the network and start suggesting ways that you can optimize the traffic across it. So right now it's manual, but we'll be, we're adding some more intelligence um, that will that will come over time. So those are our two applications that we've added right now, as you can see, pretty quick. Um, and the next the next step is to actually create the policy for those applications using um, Solona's um, other unique feature, micro slicing. Uh, people have talked about 5G slicing. They tend to talk about slicing in terms of the macro network. So that's you know Verizon or someone giving you a slice of their network. That's how MVNOs work, by the way. So if if you're you know using Mint Mobile or something, you're getting a slice of some or someone else's network. That's how they're controlling it. Um, but we're doing micro slicing, so we're taking that concept, those tools that are available in the standard, and bringing it down and making it available to enterprise networks. So we create a micro slicing policy, and um, which one are we doing first, Kevin? Oh, all right, we'll do the uh, AMR, which will select non-GBR, so non-guaranteed bit rate. <clears throat> and we're gonna choose highest priority signaling because we want that traffic to go first. We're gonna select the device group that it applies to. Remember we mentioned before we use device groups to help us define um, where policy is applied, which devices it's applied to. So that's the AMR device group. And the applications that this policy applies to and you know we have we created our AMR application, and because we're going to be pulling a video feed, so we're going to be reaching out to the AMR, and we're going to be pulling the video feed off their camera using RTSP, and uh, we're um, putting the IP address of the uh, device on the LAN that's going to be pulling that feed. So that's the AMR application, and we can put the scanner um, micro slicing in now, and this time we're going to do guaranteed bit rate for this one. And uh, we're going to use an even an even higher um, uh, spec policy for that one. And we're just putting in because it's ping. We're just putting in some low. You know, it's a low bit rate, low latency requirement. So we can put in some pretty low uh, requirements. Uh, over, like definitions on so, so there's quite a few um, acronyms. On yes. It. Okay. So uh, again, in our documentation, you know, it goes into detail of of what all the different things mean, but essentially QCIs, that you'll see those in the, um, in the spec and the um, cellular spec. Um, and we've used real time and control because it's an AMR 
and so it's a mobile robot so we're using real time and control to get the lowest the best possible performance we're applying that to sorry the scanners we're getting the best possible performance we're applying that to the scanner group and the scanner application we click save and the minute that we um click save that policy is being pushed down to edge so when we save the application edge is being made aware of that application we save the micro slicing policy edge is being made aware of that policy within moments so those are now ready and we have um, essentially completed the network build part we have an active network and let's just check yes i can't you can't see this but i have uh, an active network and if anyone wanted to connect to um that will be underscore m2k um and the password for it is all lowercase one string air salona if anyone wants to validate that you can connect out um <clears throat> someone can give me a thumbs up when they've got it um <laughs> and uh, you'll be able to see that you you have an active connection out to the internet but that is that is the the network build part of the demonstration we have an active private cellular network in the room built from scratch let me just all good all good it's working all right nice one thanks kevin great job um so yes we created the site we saw that we had some available spectrum we um added our ap got our spectrum request through um, when we did this yesterday for the first um, we were timing it we got it in eight minutes which was actually the fastest i'd ever seen it done um created our device groups so we had a logical place to put our different devices activated the devices and assigned them to their groups created our applications and then created our policy and as you can see as we said before all the skills you need to build and run this network you already have there's no mystery all the stuff that all these other vendors are saying oh you need all these professional services no you don't you can do this right now this is it maybe you can elaborate on a little bit because i know we have you know we heard other, a couple other pitches right and the other two were like black box managed service like you don't have to know anything like we're just going to take care of it all but i know from you know probably for a lot of people in this room, like we don't like, that's necessary. No. Like we want to know what's behind Dude, it. We yeah. want to know how it's working. We want to know when it's broken. Yeah. You know, why it's broken, right? And so like, I mean, personally, this is why I really like the Salona approach because you guys are saying this is more like a wireless network, APs, controller, that, like, that world, right? Mm -hmm. Cellular, just like pay a bill and don't think about it, right? Yeah. Can you elaborate on why you think that is, or just the? Uh... I mean, it, it, it's where they come from. It, it, yeah. You know, it's their DNA is very much. They build massive networks that connect millions of people across nations. <laughs> incredibly complex, um, and um, one of my colleagues, Todd, has that has one of the best um, ways of describing this. He says. You know, when if you're an enterprise and you're looking at what is essentially the DNA of a telco or carrier solution, it's like trying to land a 747 in your parking lot. And pick the right tool for the job. It's, it's that's not where they came from. It's not what they understand. And it's they're they're imposing their view of the world on the enterprise. And okay, there are there are some enterprises for which that 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 solution is going to be great absolutely no argument but for some no some do want someone else to come in and go yeah please take care of this for me i don't want to know <laughs> but others do want to be able to manage everything in house and want to have control and that's where we come in salona isn't good for big networks <laughs> 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 obviously meant to be sarcastic what's yeah. the largest deployment you guys have, have gotten into at this point um well we have a number of multi-site deployments and we have a number of campus. so indoors we have campus networks with multi-floor or indoor office buildings okay. and some outdoor coverage we have logistics and um some more sort of uh, port networks with you know extensive outdoor coverage 
Um, and we have what we're seeing in a lot of non, what we're saying is non-carpeted spaces. That's where a lot of um, activity is happening right now. I think it's probably the same for everyone. We're seeing a lot of development there, people improving their logistics and um, supply chain. Um, you know, that's that's where a lot of activity is happening. And we're seeing sort of a lot of coverage in sort of those logistics spaces and then extending to those outdoor um, spaces at the same time. I see you have, you show they have a multi-tenancy. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm in there managing multiple warehouses, different customers, but they're all very similar with scanners, can I share a micro slice across these different customers? Or maybe if you have multiple sites, can you share the micro slice across each each um, site yeah. so you don't have to reconfigure those? So you can, um, yeah, micro slices um, can be shared across um, your organization, yes. Okay. So those policies, um, the way they work um, are more, a higher level than the site. So they get applied okay. across the organization, can be. I have a question for the devices, if you have to onboard and configure a lot of them, because mm -hmm. here you guys already have them in the dashboard. Yeah. I'm guessing you did some free work to have them in the system or how yeah. does that work? So the, so the way it works is the way um, we assign assets to an organization. So essentially when someone buys a system, you would say, okay, I'm buying, you know, I'm, I'm deploying this warehouse, there's 10 APs, edge controller, and we're we need 50 SIMs. So you place your order. And then when you come into your orchestrated dashboard, all those assets are there. So you would come in and you would see 50, 50 SIMs in your 50 devices in your device dashboard. And they, you would just, you wouldn't see names. You would just see the ICC IDs and the IMSIs. All we've done is just added some names on top. So, onto so what you call uh, a device is a SIM. Yeah. And what if it moves to like a different site? Do you have to physically move the device then to another site or is this a site? So, so the way, so when, um, I don't know if you uh, saw when we were activating, when you activate, you activate it to an edge cluster. So an edge cluster could, is, is assigned to a site. Mm -hmm. So when you deactivate a SIM, that then is available to be activated to another edge cluster in your organization if ne if needs be but sims are assigned to clusters so if you were devices are assigned to clusters yeah. deploying scanners at like site a and you wanted to move them to site b yeah you would have to do some manual deactivate and then reactivate yeah and again this is all api driven so if you've got some kind of mdm and things happening you're you're making a change here that could be pushed into our platform can you leave that up for the rest of the day <laughs> <laughs> Can I go up to my room? Can, can you expand a little bit about the, the effort and the process involved in, in setting up that initial first node as well as that, that first cluster? Um, I mean, it, in terms of um, effort, in what way? I, so I think we're, we're all used to setting up controllers and, mm -hmm. and sort of building at least base configuration on that. Is that a very similar setup? Do we have to do, do we have to connect multiple like Docker or Kubernetes containers oh. together through configuration? Or is it, is it very, very, very easy? All, all you have to do is, um, so we, we, at the moment, we can supply an appliance or we can supply virtual machine images. Mm -hmm. um, and there is very little to do apart from turn it on and connect to Ethernet to to the correct port, turn it on, that's it. Everything else just happens. So it, you can either uh, allow it to get DHCP or you can you know, set an IP address. There's a, there's a control panel which you can log into when it comes up um, and you can set some basic parameters on that, but there is nothing for you to do in terms of, oh, I've got to build this image, set up these, you know, the setup Docker networking or anything like that. No, we, we, the Kubernetes stack, we take control of all of that. Okay, and then how does that connect to the orchestrator that, that uh, initially, what's that discovery? So we have, so here you'll see, so my blue cable here, that's my Solona Edge um, Ethernet port coming out of my little compute box here, mm -hmm. basically an Intel NIC size compute. That comes straight out into our switch, which is just our standard um, internet access. And that is just getting DHCP. I have a DHCP reservation on it, and that's going connecting over the normal internet that we've got here and 
phoning home to our AWS cloud where we have Slona Orchestrator and, so we, and tunneling back. So yeah, so, so it tunnels back, but how does it get assigned to your orchestrator? Oh, so we um, we assign that when we create the asset for you. Okay. So when when we um, create the asset and assign the asset to you, mm -hmm. th those keys are created so that it is um, uh, connect connects to orchestrator and, and valid. So we manage that. How do you guys are thinking of tearing your solution for other countries uh, and making it a little bit more uh, generic for other frequency bands and all of that? Yeah, I mean, um, as as Francois said, CBRS is US only. That is uh, all the SAS spectrum allocation, all those things is USA, is FCC run. Um, we are active in um, a number of other jurisdictions, obviously in Europe. Canada doesn't have, um, hasn't had, a. there is some private spectrum available, but I think you have to apply manually right now, right? They don't have, they haven't right. come up with a, an automatic assigning. I think we can provide you good couple of uh, Twitter account that you can hit up, hit up and try to make that thing move. Yeah, but there, there are, um, so in Europe that you can manually apply for spectrum and we're, we're, we're already working with some places, some jurisdictions where, you know, they're working in band 41, band 42. And we, you know, we do have support for some of those bands already, and we're already working in those jurisdictions at the early phases where they're starting to explore private mobile. So we're already working in Europe, and we, you know, we can if you can get special licenses, we can, we can definitely help with that. And I think we've 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 been talking to some of the folks up in Canada as well. But yes, we are looking to deploy private mobile networks globally. We're not just looking at the American market; we're looking at the global opportunity. And do you have customers that have like sites in multiple countries and yes. are pushing you to kind of go there? Very much so, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, as soon as someone sees what you can do with this, like, yes, I want this tool everywhere, please now. <laughs> yeah. Hey, JR. Yes, Avril. Um, in the Wi-Fi world, right, we have controllers, we have 802.1x, we have radio servers. What does that look like in the 5G enterprise world? Um, I mean, in, in the 5G enterprise world, um, it varies for us. As, as I mentioned before, we're currently, our, our AP is a 4G. Um, and we will be um, releasing 5G radios as soon as they're ready. Obviously, I'm desperate to get them because I love new toys. Um, and we are, you know, working very hard to get those released as soon as possible. Um, right now, we have our Salona Edge, Salona AP Architecture, Salona Orchestrator. Orchestrator, public or private cloud, Edge, local or cloud deployment. AP is obviously going to be deployed where you need them. That is our, with our 4G LTE radios. What happens in 5G? Nothing. That's 5G ready. There's no different. Um, we do... Um, there are some scenarios where there might be a slight architecture change, but that's only going to be for very specific industrial use cases where there might be split RAM. But that is, there are there are a couple of customers who are looking at that. But in general, the architecture that we have today for our current private mobile network will be exactly the same for five G. There'll be no change. And it does authentication and all of those things that we do in our Wi-Fi world. Yes. Yeah. There'll be, I mean, authentication in the 5G, the, in the private mobile world currently is SIM-based. There are people asking for, you know, lots of other ways of authentication and single sign-on and attaching to things like, you know, the education authentication systems and all those extra things. But right now, the main authentication system is going to be sim based and it will continue to be sim based whether that's eSIM or physical sims but that's always going to be the base layer but there may be some additional authentication systems being added on on top of that over time as we can develop it and as the demand arises um because obviously those things are supported in wi-fi right now like edgy roam and all those systems but that's a process it's pretty early but there's no concept of an external authenticator leveraged or managed by the enterprise where they can self-administer their SIM pool. Everything has to be done in the Sloan. Everything, everything is done using SIM technology, using the 4G, 5G standard, because you know we're using 
that's that's one of the reason that the medium is so reliable for connecting things like robots is because we're we're on release 14 of the standard where it's highly prescriptive yeah, yeah exactly so you know we have uh, we're we're getting a lot of the benefit from that um so you know we're we're building on top of it you know we're adding some of our own customizations like micro slicing but we're we're, we're able to benefit from from those things and build on top of it and I know Salona's really helped the enterprise work out how to provision the SIMs. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to, the, to us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so uh, you can probably go back to the devices list, Kevin. So great having someone else to help drive. <laughs> Normally when I'm doing these demos, I'm at home, I'm like pushing buttons. And I don't know if anyone, everyone else, I don't know everyone well, and Francois probably used to having stream decks and pushing loads of buttons while they're doing podcasts. This is so nice having someone else do it. Um, That's a good idea. So this, as I said before, this is our API, this is our interface to our API. This is the one we've developed. Any customer can develop their own. We publish our API spec. Um, and customers are already developing their own systems for activating um, devices and interacting with our um, authentication and device management um, system. You can see there's filter controls. There's um, we expose everything in the in the API. Um, we also have the ability to support, as we mentioned, we support physical sims and we support eSIMs. Right now, in the current release. Um, for eSIM, you um, download QR codes. It's it's a little manual, you know. It's early. We're we're still um, some of this progress is restricted by what the eSIM providers can do for us. We have to wait for their systems to be compatible with the way we want to do things because their systems are built for carriers, not for enterprise. So we're sometimes you know asking things of them that they're not ready to do yet. But with, with eSIM right now, if you download QR codes and you can ship those out to people, send them on email or whatever, but in future, there will be a lot more automation capability in there. And we're working with various MDM. Um, for those on the stream who maybe don't, MDM, mobile device management platform, so managing your mobile fleets, you'll be able to push eSIMs out to people in, in the same way that, that carriers are doing now, you'll be able to do that same kind of thing of Verizon sending out eSIMs or whatever, you'll be able to do that yourself. Um, I'm curious about day-to-day um, -day management and troubleshooting on this. Can you, uh, can you walk us through, are there, are there maps that show the placement of those access points? Are there troubleshooting tools from the, either the client perspective or the radio perspective? Yep. So if we go to the access point, one thing quickly so maps are coming um in the next release in the barcelona release but just one just to give you a quick view we have something in orchestrator called salona assistant um and it is exactly that so the idea is is that it's there to help anyone managing the system just to give them a little some hints as if there is an issue to tell you what's happening on the network if you go into the ap details now you can see we've got configuration state and operational state panels there. Um, and it says currently up. If there was an issue, you would just click on the Salona icon uh, next to up um, and it'll give you more information. So if there was a particular issue, you get some more state data there. So, you know, rather than, you know, you might be pulling SNMP polling off a traditional system, you would do API polling and you would be pulling that into your into your management network, or you could just use this. So you can see here, you know, we've got a, it says there's a SAS cert issue, but um, we're still up. Um, so yeah, but that's that's how in orchestrator right now, we're giving you some more contextual based information if there is an error. There's also things, so you can look at a client. So if someone calls you up and says, oh, I'm having issues with connectivity. So if we pull up the hotspot, uh, Kevin, on the devices, we should be able to see the staff hotspot. We should be able to see its connection history. So it's connected to a network. We can pull down the connected AP history. So we'll be able to see if it was moving through the network, we'll be able to see which APs it, could, it had connected to. And you could also see things like traffic um, that has been transacted through it. So as you talk about uh, tracking devices throughout your infrastructure, there are many Wi-Fi applications centered around location, context. Any, any 
such similar concept in the CBRF world? What kind of fidelity can I get? Or are those use cases just simply not being explored today? Uh, currently, we're not providing any location feeds. It is something that is being investigated. There are, there are other things that are higher priority currently, but location is something that is actually in the specs um, for um, 5G. Um, you know, enhanced location services is all in there along with, you know, ultra low latency and all those other things. So they are in there and we will, you know, we do intend to, to build support for those kinds of um, features in future, but in future. Just to have, have to follow up on that, do you know what the technique they're using for that location is? Um, I don't off the top of my head. I used to do a bunch of stuff with location on Wi-Fi, but I would, there's... On Wi-Fi, but in CBRS. I in CBRS, it's, it, I don't know what the spec is. Avril probably knows mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in location. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're outdoors, then most firms have GPS right, for, for your location, that's your question, right? And if you're indoors, there's a variety of different techniques that can be supported on cellular, like triangulation, all this kind of thing. So you can either have it done in the device or it can be done by the network. Yeah. And, and so, so both, all those options. So outdoor, fun. you know, we've all watched TV shows where they can track, you know, which tower you're on and then triangulate. Yep. Yeah. I was just wondering what the technique, if, if yeah. 5G technique works indoors in a warehouse, and then are you at 10 meter resolution or two? They, they are talking about, I know that they are talking about sub one meter resolution using 5G indoors. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Yet to be seen. <laughs> there, there was talk of sub five meter resolution using Wi-Fi indoors, and I've never seen that. So, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know we'll, we'll see whether that comes to pass. But definitely possible, and with TDD networks, very possible. Would this be possible to deploy in a hospital, say a million square feet, patients walk in and say, you know, they got to walk to a window to make a phone call. How could they just roll in, jump on, you know, how, is that, is that possible? Oh, let's talk about a neutral host. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, neutral host. So um, this is something that we all want desperately but we're all beholden to the major carriers to decide when they're going to say yes to. Um, it is, it would be great that the day, you know, we're already deployed in some healthcare situations that the patient can come in and, you know, they can just automatically connect to the system that the hospital is deployed and get five bars of coverage and no longer are they having to go to a window to make a phone call. Yes. In, a, in a horrible, stressful situation. Um, it's coming. It'll happen. Everyone knows it'll happen. It's just a case of when they relent and when they decide to do it. You, you think including voice services? Yeah. You, so you think that, that there's going to be a day where you'll see a CBRS enterprise on network where your AT&T device with your AT&T phone number can come on completely loose side of the AT&T network and you can still make a call? Yeah. Wow. One day. I don't know when. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but those are things that are being worked, right? Yes. The, 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 techn te the, the technical barrier is not the issue. Um, that is not the problem. It is will and um, uh, contractual. But, you know, it's really just a case of when they, when they decide that it, it, it's, it's the right time to, to do it and that the networks that are being deployed can meet the quality that they require. Because they, well, they want to make sure that when their customer does that, that it's going to work, right? Like it has to be a good quality. So there's also a lot of work to be done, a lot of trust to be built, and testing to be done to make sure that that, that quality is maintained. I don't know, I think oh. it wasn't all that concerned with quality when they rolled out Wi-Fi calling from people's <laughs> houses, so they didn't have to put up a cell tower. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling some things there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, the, I would imagine the roaming piece of that would be a big challenge too, right? Going from a different provider, different frequency, completely different network, and then trying to do a seamless roam to a neutral host, different, you know, another frequency, another provider, if you will. Yeah, I mean, actually, again, this is where having having years and years and years of of, of uh, technical specifications for the standard in place really help us out. A lot of that work's been done. 
our own approach is to use something called a Mocan gateway, M-O-C-N, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, that's how we connect carrier networks or any other network to our enterprise network, and they can peer with each other. And that roaming user can come in and see their network populated out of our, you know, they can camp on our AP. That technical solution already exists. We already have it. You know, if a carrier wants to provide services using our network, they can. They can do it today. Cool. It's just a validation exercise. What if we didn't care about roaming? What if we just wanted someone to walk in and then they go to the internal part of So the one, of, one of the cool things I've seen, one of the cool things I did really early on was um, if you got Wi-Fi calling on your enabled on your phone, and there is zero network. So if you're in a situation where there's like your your MNO, your Verizon, your AT&T, or your main carriers, just there's no coverage at all, nothing, you're in a hole, and you have uh, your CBRS connection, Wi-Fi calling will pop up. So we connected to a little Wi-Fi network. You started up back hole to the, the CBRS network. Could you give us the eSIM so we can actually directly connect to this? Um, well, we can give you, well, we can give you, um, have we got any eSIMs on this one, Kevin? I don't think we've got eSIMs on this platform. We've got, we've got a oh, physical yeah. SIM if you've got an iPhone. Okay, sure. Is that part of the demo? I'm not, yeah. Are you yeah. It? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Jared, so, do you want to go over um, the two? Yeah, let's, let's before, before, before we get on to giving you some SIMs, let's, let's, <laughs> let's show you just the, um, the, the, the micro slicing in action because we, we want to show you that the, the policy controls role. You've got to ask about that. Oh. Can you repeat again what the difference is between your micro slicing and how carriers do slicing? Like what was the, you said it was unique to. Yeah. So um, let's say, uh, so in a carrier network, they, these QCIs, they exist. So let's just take um, Verizon, for example, they can do this. They can slice a network. They have QCIs. They've had them for 10 years and that their, their visible network, their MVNO brand, They'll, I don't know what QCI they use, but that's on a different QCI because it has a different quality of service to a Verizon native customer. Right? And the same when they have another MVNO, they'll put them on a different QCI. So that's how they're doing slicing in their big macro networks. right? So, and there's potential they do offer that to some enterprises, but you've got to be... You know, you've got to be like a Fortune 100, basically, to get that kind of access. Um, we're making that technology, we're giving that access to that technology to the enterprise. So you're able to use those uh, mechanisms, those QCI mechanisms that are built into the spec to control traffic. That's why we're, you know, okay. we call it micro slicing. So you're able to take that macro technology and use it in your micro environment or application. Yeah. And do it, you know, as, as you can see, we can say it's for a host not for 8 million handsets that are using this one particular brand, right? Yeah. So it's for this piece of traffic going to that IP address. 